Hello, All Nations Church family. woo So good to be with you again. Wow, what a privilege this is. Let's turn to the Lord and let's look for Him to help us, to give us understanding and to give us counsel as we walk in His Word. Precious Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We never want to take for granted the privilege we have of access to your beautiful presence. Just breathe upon this room right now, Lord. Fill our hearts, give us instruction, breathe upon the Word of God, and may the seed of God's Word find its mark in our heart, convert us, transform us, strengthen us from the inside out, all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. A mother was preparing pancakes for her sons. Kevin, he was five, and Ryan was three, a couple of little fellows, and the boys began to argue over who would get the first pancake. Their mother saw the opportunity for a moral lesson, as moms always do. And she said, now, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin, the older brother, he turned to his younger brother and he said, Ryan, you be Jesus. I love that story. I love that picture. I love how that we want. There's something built into us even at a young age. We want to go forward. We want to win. We want to come out on top. But how about today we all be like in Jesus and enforce the non-negotiable boundaries that say no fear here. Today we begin our No Fear Here part four series and we take back your rest. I call this part four, take back your rest. If you didn't get part three, it's on video. We put it out in the middle of the week. You can get part three of the no fear here. It's basically we go through 1 Samuel chapter 17 and we talk about how that um, we give the principles and the instructions of how David actually by faith took down Goliath the giant, the giant of fear. Make sure you get part three. But we're going to build on, we're going to do a little review. In part one, we learned that fear is an enemy number one. But that perfect love evicts fear. When you get perfect love on the case, it always wants to evict fear. In part two, we learn that fear is a talker. That's right. Giants, storms, mountains, problems, bills, they all like to talk and they all like to be heard. But faith is the antithesis of fear and it shuts it down with God's spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Now in part three... We learned from David, the shepherd boy, how to actually slay the giant of fear. And that was a good, good um, practical lesson in how we can apply our faith every day. Today, part four, I want to talk about take back your rest. You need to do this now. You can do this now. 1 John 4, 8, 4, 18. 1 John 4, 18 says, fear has torment. Who wants to live with torment? You know, the enemy loves to torture people. The devil wants to torture you and your family. His favorite tool, yes, fear. He often uses a torture technique called sleep deprivation. Did you know that the Geneva Convention and many countries have banned sleep deprivation as a means of interrogation because it's inhumane, it's dangerous, it's torture. No sleep ultimately equals death. And so the Geneva Convention, it says you can't do that even when you're enemies, you're trying to get information out of them. You can't use sleep deprivation. But the enemy of your soul, he doesn't play by those rules. No, and he loves to use sleep deprivation on you. So how does sleep deprivation work? Well, let me just give you a few scientific facts. Most adults need seven to eight hours sleep a night. Sleep deprivation leads to this, feeling moody, fatigued, Irritable, irritable, depressed, forgetful, increase of appetite, unmotivated. Some of you in this room, you're kind of looking at each other and you're thinking, I think that's you. Tragic accidents involving airplanes, that comes from sleep deprivations. Airplanes, ships, trains, automobiles, even nuclear power plants have suffered great tragedies because of just simple operator error, which backs up on sleep deprivation. It goes to this, it leads to a lower immune system, increased risk of chronic illness, increase of fat storage, increase of risk of type 2 diabetes, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Some of you are thinking, I got to go home and get some sleep right now. 
negative effects on your hormone production, you can accumulate what experts and scientists call sleep debt. That must be reconciled. It, it's like swiping your credit card. You've got to pay back that sleep debt. People can go for weeks, months, years accumulating sleep debt. And if you don't get it back, it can lead to all these diseases and all this breakdown physically. Increased feelings of worthlessness, inadequacy, low self-esteem, powerlessness. Remember what Jesus, um, what the word said, um, Paul wrote to Timothy, right? He said, God has not given you a spirit of fear or sleep deprivation, but of power, of love, of a sound mind. Negative effects on your short and long-term memory. Decreased problem-solving ability. Decreased creativity and concentration. You know, you might be a boss, a CEO, a owner of a company. Your employees, it matters if they get a good night's sleep because it affects their problem-solving and their creativity. It can actually increase anxiety and lead to poor balance. Sleep is God's car wash for your brain. Let me explain this. This is so amazing how God has designed you. You are, as Psalm 139 says, fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are God's works. Now check this out. God has designed a brainwash to happen every night when you sleep. I'm not talking about, you know, some cult brainwash. I'm talking about an actual, like a car wash, taking your car through it. God has designed like a, a brainwash, like a car wash, to take your brain through every night. When you sleep at night, your brain cortex, it... It actually, when it comes into a rest, it shrinks a little bit. And they say the cerebrospinal fluid, the S, the CSV, is released in pulsing waves and it washes toxins and memory impairing proteins from off of your brain. Can you believe that? It helps improve brain function. The enemy counters by using fear, worry, depression to steal your sleep because he knows this device God's built into you. He doesn't want that cerebral spinal fluid flowing around your brain. So he tries to get you worried. He tries to get you stressed. When you do that, they've actually scientifically measured the brain that it turns like um, on the, the scan, it turns red and it inflames. Your brain inflames. Some of the foods you eat inflame your brain so that at night it's swollen and the fluid can't wash your brain. Well, what happens is these toxic proteins build up on your brain and they begin affecting your memory, your creativity. They begin making you depressed. They begin making you sad. The enemy counters by using this fear and worry tactic. That's why he even wants to get into your food that you eat. The devil wants your brain toxic, impaired, depressed, stressed, because he knows that God has countered his tactics with God giving you a spirit of power, love, and what? A sound mind. That's God's gift for you, a sound mind, but you have to support it. The enemy's strategy is to steal your rest. Rest is critical to your future. Rest is critical to your marriage, to your family, to your, your career. Rest is critical to your physical health. Rest. Rest is one of the Ten Commandments. It's a big deal. God rested on the seventh day. So how does the enemy do this? How does he do this strategy? We got to be wary of his devices. He starts with a lie. He always starts with a lie, which simply is doubting a truth principle. Well, does, does God really love me? Will God really provide for me? Eh, probably not. Right? That's the lie. How about this one? You know, God takes care of those who take care of themselves. So I just got to buckle down and I got I to gotta be more busy. I got to work even harder. You know, God, God's not going to, you know, help me out here in this. I got to help. God helps those who help themselves. Another big lie. God doesn't care about your safety or your family's protection. After all, God creates catastrophes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and destructive lightning and storms. Right? Wrong. God doesn't do that. God is the God of life. God loves. God is light. In Him there is no death. God says, I have plans for you, and none of it is destructive. Never, ever, ever mess with my Heavenly Father's character. God is good all the time. His mercy is forever. It's everlasting. 2 Peter 3.9, God is not willing that any should perish. Any should perish. That's why he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, 
to die on a cross for you and me. God so loved the world. John 10.10 says this, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, but I came to give you life. Life. If God walks in the room, if love walks in the room, love has come to give you life. Never build a doctrine off your experience. That's the problem. When people begin to doctrinalize off their experience or somebody else's experience, they start messing and building doctrine around facts. How many know that facts can change? I was hungry this morning. Then I had breakfast. The facts changed. Suddenly you're full. The facts can change. Truth is unchanging. Truth is absolute. God's truth with a capital T. Facts change. Never blame death on God who is life, light, and love. I remember Pam and her dad telling me about when he was a little boy, he was about nine years old, and his mom suddenly got sick, and through one thing or another, Bruce's mom died. Pam's dad, dad's mom passed away. He was only nine years old. And so when he went to the funeral, um, a pastor came up to him wanting to comfort him, and he said, well, son, he said, you know, your, God loved your mom, and he was lonely for your mom, so God took your mom home because he was lonely for her. See, that was a lie. That was a lie from the enemy. And all it did was produce fear in that boy's heart, anger in that boy's heart, resentment toward God in that boy's heart. It didn't comfort him. It maybe made him feel good in the 30 seconds that it was being told. But then after that, you know, little boys and little girls start reasoning and they're like, why would God kill my mom because he was lonely for her. Look, God has promised to never leave you or forsake you. He's not lonely for you. God's every bit here on earth as he is in heaven. God is here with you. God loves you. God lives on the inside of you. If you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, my friend, God's not lonely for you. He's living in you. He's with you everywhere you go. God is with you. He's ever-present. He's om omnipresent. He's omniscient. God is everywhere. Why would God kill a little boy's mom? No, no, see? You may not understand what happened in that situation, but trust me, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the absolute. Jesus has come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Don't believe the lies. Don't doctrinalize the facts and try to make a doctrine that you're calling the truth. Let the truth stand on its own. Elijah believed a lie. Remember the great prophet Elijah? Elijah believed a lie to the point where he got so afraid, so depressed, he became suicidal. Let me give you the backstory. Elijah, he's this great prophet of God. God talks to him and God talks through him. So Elijah, he has a showdown with 850 false prophets of, the, of Baal who were partying with Jezebel. And basically they made this contest. They're going to make this big sacrifice and the prophets of Baal get to go first. And if their God will bring down fire out of heaven and consume the sacrifice, then their God is God. But then Elijah gets to take over, and if his God has fire come down out of heaven, consumes a sacrifice, well then Elijah's God is God. Well, of course, you know the story. The prophets of Baal danced, partied, did every kind of crazy thing, were cutting themselves, singing all kinds of songs, brought in the best rock bands, and nothing happened. But they just smashed down the altar. Elijah builds it back up, and then he buries it in water. Over and over, he, has, he builds a trench around it and covers it, soaks the sacrifice in water. The wood was just soaking. The, every bit of the sacrifice was soaking with water. And Elijah just says a simple prayer, just says, God, let the people know that you're God. Fire comes down out of heaven, probably a big bolt of lightning in the middle of a sunny day because there would have been no rain. There was a drought. So this big bolt of lightning comes down out of heaven and consumes the sacrifice, melts the rocks. That's how hot it is. I'm telling you, it was so amazing. Then afterwards, Elijah says to the people, look, I'm the bona fide thing. I'm a real prophet. They're not. I'm serving the real God. They're not. The people agreed. And then they took the 850 false prophets out and they executed all of them. Immediately following that, when all of the wrong people, the wrong people get out of the way, God sends, sends an abundance of rain, which ends the drought. But... King Ahab and Jezebel, they hear about this and they hear about her false 
prophets who she used to go shopping with on, with on Rodeo Drive. All of her buddies are killed and she's very angry about it. And so here's what happens. Elijah sees God's power. He sees how God answers and that God is faithful. But yet look at what happens. He sees the miracle, sees the sign, but Jezebel sends a threat to Elijah and says, you're as good as dead. Elijah believes the lie. He takes the lie. He runs. Even though the rain's coming down, God's ended the drought. Elijah believes the lie. Guess what happens, right? The whole thing, eclipsing reality, right? Fraudulent, eclipsing the all reality. He takes the lie, fear comes in, suicidal thoughts and words come on him. He's out in the desert. He's laying under a juniper tree. He's so bad, in such bad shape, he stops eating and drinking. An angel has to come and actually nurse him and feed him and get him in a cave to some shelter. And we pick up the story in 1 Kings 19, 11, and 13. And I love this, inter this interchange here. Verse 11, and the angel says to Elijah, he says, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. See, the wind was destructive, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, and it was destructive, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, and after the earthquake, a fire, and the fire was destructive, but the Lord was not in this fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle stillness and a still small voice. And guess where God is? He's in the voice. God's talking gently to his son. And when Elijah heard the voice, he wrapped his face in the mantle. He went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him, God's voice. And he said, <laughs> I love this. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, fear will cause you to go to the wrong place. Fear will cause you to run away and get out of context, right? Just like our grandparents, Adam and Eve, fear caused them to run from God's presence. And God comes back and he's like, son, daughter, what are you doing here? Why are you on the run? When you have no rest, when you're feeling pursued, guess what you do? You start cave shopping for the rest. Notice the cultural trend in this day and age. All the men want a man cave and all the women want a she shed. Everybody's pursuing isolation, escape, trying to get the rest that God has already ordained for them. My friend, you don't need a man cave. When Elijah, when he answers God, when he says something interesting to God, he says, I'm the only one. This is after that. He says, I'm the only one left, God, who serves you. Poor me. I'm the only one left who serves you. And now the king's army is searching to kill me. Basically, he says, I got to get me a man cave, right? And God answers Elijah back and he says, I still have 7,000 in Israel dedicated to me who have not bowed a knee to these false gods. You see, again, a lie comes in. That fraudulent thinking, right? That wrong thinking eclipsing all reality. Like I said, never build a doctrine on your experience or your perception of events. Don't do it. I warn you. Go to the Word of God and find out what God says about it. Elijah had totally, 100% believed a lie. He believed Jezebel's threat of death. He believed he was alone. That was a lie. He believed he was forsaken. He wasn't. He believed he was isolated. He isolated himself. He's the one that went at man cave shopping, so isolation pursues more isolation. He was worried, anxious, stressed, sleep deprived. Elijah was a bona fide mess looking for a rest, right? Are you a mess looking for a rest? Jesus says this in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you what work to do. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I'm going to give you like this um, spiritual missionary assignment. Is that what he said? He says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. My friend, signs and wonders don't cast down fear. If they did, Elijah would have been fearless. He saw the signs and the wonders. It didn't make fear go away. God can do wonders in your life, but that won't give you a good night's sleep. God can bless you, provide for you, chase every enemy away, but it will not change if you believe a lie. You will not be able to rest. The lie must be evicted and replaced 
with truth. Until you know the truth, you can't be free. That's what the word says. You won't enjoy the rest. Perfect love casts down all fear. But how do you get the love inside of you so that it overpowers? You've got to invite the spirit of love. Did you know that God is love? God casts down all fear. You've got to allow God to not just live with you, but live in you. Let's return to 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has torment. Wow. Dr. Caroline Leaf, she wrote that book, Who Switched Off My Brain? And in it, she talks about the brain's natural pharmacy. Did you know the brain is a natural pharmacy? God has given our brain this natural storehouse of these biochemicals that release like endorphins and serotonin. The release of these biochemicals start a chain reaction that creates a positive environment where intellect flourishes, further promoting mental and physical health. When you give in to stress thinking, then you also release biochemicals, but not the good stuff. A chain reaction occurs. You begin to feel frustration, fear, anger, anxiety, bitterness. That destroys your physical health. Research tells us that fear triggers more than 1,400 known physical and chemical responses. Hormones and neotransmitters are negatively affected by this. Look, the enemy's strategy is to rob you of rest, hijack your thinking. It's a tactical torture technique. Fear wants to steal your sleep so that the cerebral spinal fluid wash that God's design doesn't occur. It doesn't happen. He wants to sabotage your DNA genes with death. He wants to strangle us. The enemy wants import. He wants to import a storm into your thoughts all day in the middle of the night. So let's talk about another stormy sea that Jesus' disciples had. Jesus had just fed the multitudes miraculously, and then he instructs his disciples, get in the boat and go to the other side, guys. Matthew 14, 22. Pretty straightforward, right? Get in the boat and go to the other side. The problem is another huge storm comes up, and it seems to be against them. This time Jesus is not asleep. He's not even in the boat, but he comes walking on the water. And of course, that made the boys at ease, right? When Jesus comes walking on the water, of course, they're like, oh, okay. Oh, now we can calm down. The miracles are here, everybody. Let's just calm down. Oh, man, we, now we got a peace. Let's, let's see what actually happens. Matthew 14, starting at verse 26. And when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they screamed, they shrieked out with fright. But immediately he spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Peter replied to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, well, it's me, obviously, so what am I going to say? Come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the effects of the wind, he was frightened, it says. Peter was frightened. He began to sink. He cried out, Lord, you got to save me. Verse 31, immediately Jesus extended his hand and caught Peter, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know, sometimes I think people interject their own dialogue on that verse, 31. And immediately Jesus extended his hand and caught him saying, Man, that was really good for your first time water walking, right? Good for you. Good for you, Peter. Come on, we, we got it. Not many people have done this. This is kind of a new faith trick, but good for you. You did it. It doesn't say that. Jesus actually gave him a little bit of a spanking. He said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Verse 32, and when they got in the boat, now look at this, when Jesus gets in the boat, remember the assignment, get in the boat and go to the other side. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Can we please just start keeping things simple? Can we just focus here on what the main outcome is supposed to be? Getting to the other side. Jesus said, Get in the boat, go to the other side. Notice how Peter's water walking, event pursuing, give me a sign and a wonder pursuit slowed everybody in the boat down. The 11 other guys got to wait for Peter to do his thing, right? While everybody waits for Jesus to rescue him. But the whole objective should have been, Jesus, get in our boat. Invite Jesus into your boat and quit trying to prove that you can do it. It's all about Jesus. It's not about you. You know, if Peter had actually successfully walked on the water back and forth, 
I can guarantee you he would have launched Peter's walking, water walking ministry. And it's not like he was very good at it because the thing is, even after Jesus was risen from the grave and he was out fishing and Peter was out doing his thing, when he saw it was Jesus on the beach, the Bible says Peter jumped in the water. He didn't water walk then. Invite Jesus into your boat and quit trying to prove that you can do it. John Maxwell said this, people who focus on their fears don't grow. We know that Peter struggled with fear. He didn't grow. It says they become paralyzed. You become paralyzed in your growth. So how do we enter that for rest, my friend? It's by faith. But let me give you a very practical verse of Scripture that will help lead you in that way. I love Philippians 4 verse 8. It says this, Finally, believers, in conclusion, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's Word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. Think on these things. This is how we live fear-free. This is how to put up the no fear here sign on the lawn of your life. This is the practical that ignites the spiritual. Here's the oil. Now you flip the switch and get the fire burning. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17 says. And faith is the antithesis of fear. 2 Timothy 1, 7. I got to bring you back to it again. For God has not given you and me a spirit of fear. My friend, God hasn't given, if you've got fear anywhere in your life, it's your number one enemy, and God has not given you that spirit of fear. It doesn't come from God. God gives you a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. You have a spiritual legal right to God's amazing thoughts if you've received Jesus as your personal Savior. If you've never done that, it's so easy. If you're tired of being driven by fear, this is so easy to fix because Jesus has done the heavy lifting. If you've never received Jesus, just pray this simple prayer with me right now. It's like, just pray this. Jesus, I ask you to be my Savior. You died on the cross for me. You paid the price to redeem me from the curse. Forgive me of all my sins. You've been raised up from the grave. I accept you into my heart. I make you now the Lord of my life. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? And now let me pray a prayer for you so that you can live fearless and faithful. You might want to even stand if you're struggling with fear, if you're struggling with anxiety. If you've, if a lot of these symptoms I've laid out, if that's you and you've been struggling, you might want to just, with every head bowed and every eye closed, acknowledge, that's me, God. God, see me. That's me. This is me confessing I need help. You might want to just stand right now and receive this prayer I'm about to pray for you. This is for you. Heavenly Father, we dedicate the arena of our minds to whatever is true, honorable, whatever is right and pure. We choose to think on what is lovely and admirable. Our minds are a no fear here zone dedicated to the love and praise of you, Father God. Thank you for reminding us that Jesus calls us to his rest. We honor you, Father, when we enter into that rest. You remind us to obey, and that is better than sacrifice any day. There's power in your word, and it's the force of your unfailing love. So, Father, right now, we let go of any and all fear right here at the foot of the cross. All worry and anxiety, we confess it right here at the foot of the cross. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now let's seal by God's Holy Spirit, what the Lord has done in your heart today in delivering you from all fear. How do we do that? We come to the precious body 
and blood of Jesus. God gave us this ability to come and constantly bring our minds and our remembrance to the finished work of the cross through the body, the broken body of Christ and the shed blood of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11, it says this, I received of the Lord that which I passed on you, that the Lord on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. Jesus, thank you for your broken body for us. Lord, intentionally, purposefully, you had the crown of thorns pushed down on your head. Intentionally, you had the whip placed on your back with those stripes. Intentionally, you suffered all of that brokenness in your body that our bodies might be redeemed even from the agreements we've made with fear and worry and anxiety. And you're, You had your body broken for us so that, Lord, you might redeem even our brain stem and our brain that the cerebral spinal fluid might begin to wash again in the evening and we might have a proper rest. That's what this broken body means to us. It's the antidote to our pain, to our suffering, to the enemies and trappings. So right now, in the name of Jesus, we honor you, Lord, your body, and we thankfully receive the bread. And in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant established in my blood. Do this. Here's something we can do. He said, do this. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. You want to be affectionate with Jesus. This, the master himself is saying, this is being affectionate with me. When you do this, when you take this cup, you affectionately remember me. Master, we thank you for your blood. We honor you. We honor what this blood means to us. It means freedom. Lord, it means peace. It means that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God and that we have a legal right to the peace and we also have a legal right to the destruction of everything that the enemy has meant to war against our mind, will, and emotions in our body. Thank you, Jesus. You've forgiven us and this blood is proof that we are children of the Most High God. We receive it, calling you affectionately to remembrance in honor of the King Most High. Let's drink the cup. Now would you all stand and let's sing a song of praise and celebration to God. <laughs> 